Boston College's offensive line has been a sense of strength for BC in a few of the last couple of years. Remember 2022, though, it was a big issue. Will those issues pop its ugly head again in 2024? We're going to talk about it. You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Locked On Boston College. I am your host, AJ Black. This is your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So yesterday I gave you a spring practice preview. I went to the scrimmage on Saturday, gave you some of the highlights, some of the people that I noticed. And then after I got off the podcast, I was like, you know what groups I didn't do justice when I was talking about this? With the two lines. Sometimes those hog mollies are not who we talk enough about here on Lockdown Boston College. But as you've seen in years past, and hey, I'm sure Bill O'Brien would agree with Jeff Halfley when he says that's the most important group of uh, players that you have out there are your offensive line and your defensive line. So how is this group looking? How is the offensive line looking? So you lost two players. You're two guards. You lost Christian Mahogany and you lost Kyle Hergel. Both are going to be uh, in the NFL or hopefully Hergel can make it to the NFL. Mahogany is definitely going to be in the, you know, he's a first couple days, first couple round offensive lineman. So you now have to replace two guards. You have pushed Logan Taylor from tackle to one of the guards. And you're most likely going to put Jude Bowery where Logan Taylor was. And then you have this open challenge, basically. It's like what practice is all about, right? You want to have guys play their butts off to see who can get that spot. And it's between Jack Conley and Kevin Klein right now. Those are the two that, to me, look like the two spots looking for the, uh, like the two players looking at that guard spot. Now, two years ago, if you were to tell me that Jack Conley was going to be uh, in the starting lineup again, I would be really worried. He struggled. He of, of some of the guys that really struggled in 2022, Conley was near the top. He had a tough year. But credit to to Conley, credit to the off Matt Applebaum and that staff too, for sticking with him, because I thought. Jack Conley had a good season last year. He found his role as that six offensive lineman. Now, the big question is, will he be able to do more than just be that six guy wearing that number 44, being the extra offensive lineman? So in practice so far, haven't seen a ton of sacks. Thomas Castellanos, you know, when he works with the ones, he's hard to sack. And, you know, he'll he'll just tuck it and run. So I haven't seen a ton of pressure on him. Now, that could be just the um, product of a poor offensive defensive line, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I, I didn't see either Klein or Conley get beat that badly. Now, my biggest question after that, so who would be the winner? I'm not sure yet. I'm going to guess... Right now, it's Jack Conley, just based off of what I've seen. And he's got the experience. I'm going to guess they're going to go with the guy that they trust. So that would be my guess for that other spot. Now, the other offensive line question I watched is where's the depth at? (laughs) You know, last year, Jeff Halfley talked a lot about the offensive line depth because they brought in all these guys. Um, And they brought in some transfers, you know, Kurgel and Taylor. And they had some players that had experience backing them up you know the experience may not have been the greatest experience but they played so who do you have as backups well Dwayne Alec will be your backup center you have Eagle insider favorite Jack Funk I believe will be a tackle you have um I I I, and that's where it kind of like kind of you have to dig and dig and dig to figure out who will be next right you might see Otto Hess 
you might see um, a few other guys. Now, when I was watching um, the offensive line as a group, I only think I counted like seven or eight healthy guys right now. They're pretty thin. Elijah Krasnovic is not practicing. They get the kid from Serbia. Pop, it's Popsai, the freshman from uh, Senegal. He practiced, but he looks pretty raw. I mean, he's just learning how to play the game. He, You can't get him out there. <laughs> you just can't get him out there yet. And he was hurt. He didn't practice the last game. I'm not sure why. Um, the last scrimmage. So he, you're missing him. So that leads me to this question. I think BC really needs to look in the transfer portal. And, and it could be to challenge at any of the positions uh, or add depth. I, I think it's you're looking interior offensive line. Now, Halfley looked at a, interior offensive lines, but it's Jeff Halfley, and he just didn't have any luck. I, want, I have to wonder, I ponder, will Bill O'Brien have more luck at that? And I think he may. I think he might have a better pitch to an offensive lineman than Halfley did. You already have Applebaum there, so you have part of a continuity from that old, the old staff, but you have that added NFL readiness that you can bring with Will Long and Bill O'Brien. I think that will sell it. Now, on the defensive side of the, of the line, Sheeta Salah is gone. He is at Purdue, uh, and he was the only loss that you had. You have some injuries up front that you're dealing with right now, that defensive line. George Rooks is coming back from an injury. And Ty Clemens, who I believe missed all of last year, also is coming back. They both are wearing yellow jerseys during practice, meaning that they're coming back from an injury. And I'm not sure in terms of football knowledge what that means. Like, it's just like lay up on them or whatever. But they're both coming back. So your starting edges to go along with that is Donovan Azaraku and Neto Ekpala. You saw, I saw a little bit of Edward Kalengi out there, to, Gilbert Tongrongu. So you got a couple there, uh, but they didn't get anyone in the transfer portal, if I believe, if I, if my memory serves me correct. So, oh no, they did. Said, said McConnell, who was more of an, he was, I think he was playing more interior. He's the guy from Illinois. He's a bigger kid. kid. He's not, a, he does not look like an edge rusher. So you have um, a lot of the same guys as last year. Interior, interior defensive line, it looked like Quan Williams playing a, a lot. And Cam Horsley, who I think is a, a real treat that BC is getting back. Cam Horsley is back. And I thought this group looked good. And I think this is the group that could change a lot from last year based on the defensive schemes of Tim Lewis. Because I think Tim Lewis is, as we've said on this podcast, going to let these guys do more. Not just like sit back and, you know, cage rush and all that kind of stuff. I think he's going to be a little bit more aggressive, which may get them burned here and there, but it also may cause BC to be more of a havoc uh, reigning defense. Now, at practice, I saw Ekpala a lot making some big plays, which is big. Now, now it's it's a scrimmage. And what was Ekpala's big issue last year was he'd get to the quarterback. We could never bring him down. In this one, he just needs to get to the quarterback. He decided to do part two. So I'm not sure if that issue will clear itself up. Hopefully it will. But that was a big issue last year. Now, in a moment, we're going to step away from football because I just wanted to get into those offensive and defensive lines, talk a little bit about that. I want to get into basketball because on Tuesday, BC opens up the NIT. And I want to look at who they're playing, why it's a, such a great rivalry, and much more. We'll get into all of that in just a moment. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any and all of the 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Oregon Ducks are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They say, win life, go Rogue, and that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com.
I love my Fire TV. I I use it for everything, whether it's watching my kids' shows, watching streaming, it my you know watching cable. It's got everything on it. It is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as that Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether you're into week opening weekend of baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire Channels is the best part of this because Fire TV has created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and conference conference college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking channels as well. Check out Fire TV on F- channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. And if you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me. You can check out Locked On Boston College on this. Make sure you learn more at www.amazon.com slash Locked On fire tv this is locked on boston college i am your host aj black and on sunday evening as we were recording last yesterday's episode you haven't checked it out go back and make sure you listen to that bc found out that their season was not over and we got that feeling throughout the day as uh, teams that were pouting and did not want to follow through opted out. We saw Rick Patino pack up his bag and go home. We saw Syracuse decide that they didn't want to play because they were too banged up. We saw a bunch of other teams as well decide that the NIT was not for them. And you know what? I thought Tom Crean of ESPN said it best. When you have an opportunity to let your players play, and most of them are not going to play ever again, you take that opportunity. The fact that some of these coaches just opted out is selfish and it's bad for your team. It's just, it's not a good look. And I'm so glad that Boston College is in it because this gives Boston College a chance to play in the postseason the first time since 2018 when they played against Western Kentucky and got smoked at home. (laughs) That was a fun year. I believe BC was right on the bubble that year. Um, And they had Kai Bowman. They had Jerome, I believe they had Jerome Robinson that year. They had a lot going for them. It just kind of ended, it kind of fizzled out in that that NIT game. I feel good about this game going against Providence because this is a um, historical rivalry. I, I, I can't believe how many times these two teams have played. First of all, BC has played um, Providence 113 times. And they are tied with Holy Cross as BC's most common opponent. So that's going to break today, uh, on Tuesday. BC is 52-60 and 60 all-time in the series with Providence. And the last time they played was five years ago. 2018, the BC lost 100-95 to 95 in overtime. That was the year after the NIT bid. They've got, This series goes back all the way to 1946. And... They haven't. They've lost their last four at P, at the um, Providence Civic Center slash Dunkin' Donuts Center. So they have. BC needs to. This is going to be a tough one for the Eagles. But good news for BC is that two of Providence's top players are not going to play on. It does not look like that either of them are going to play on Tuesday, and that is Rich Barron and Devin Carter. Devin Carter was the Big East player of the year, one of the best players in the country, and obviously would be a massive loss for Providence. Now, it sounds like Kim English is going to hold him out because he's banged up. And you, you got to respect that. I'm not sure. I don't know. Like, I don't follow the NBA draft enough if he's an NBA draft. I mean, he sounds like I mean, if he's a Big East player of the year. He's got to be. So maybe they just want to keep him healthy. So that's, I don't blame them. But these are two of their best players, and they're both going to miss this game. That's a big, big, big deal for BC. Plus, on top of that, Kim English spent most of, was it Saturday or Sunday, whining about analytics and how the Big East is getting screwed. So you get the feeling when you go into a game like this, that when your coach is over there whining about it, 
that they don't really care all that much about being in this. I'm, I'm sure, you know, they're going to take it because they get a payday and it's more playing and props to them for at least taking it. But when you have two teams, you have team a who, as I just said, was whining. They have two of their stars out and they're, they're kind of disappointed and probably not all that motivated because they're in a B level tournament that they don't feel like they should be in. They're kind of just there. And then you have the other team who is more hungry that, you know, did not play as well as they could have, but are pumped because now they get to play again together. They're healthy. They have all their guys and their star is, is healthy in Quinton post. Who is going to win that game a or B? And I just said Quinton post name. So it doesn't matter. It's it's team B. It just seems like a slam dunk win for BC. The Eagles are a four point underdog going into this game. But all those factors I just told you make me believe that Boston College should be the favorite and I think BC is going to win it. I love, I I think, you know, BC was playing exceptionally well in that tournament. They just ran into dead legs in that UVA game, right? They They played three games in three days. And unlike NC State, who had the depth to get through that, which they certainly did, BC did not have that depth. And that's what killed them. You were de- you basically had to ride the the starting five or six for almost the entire game, and by that UVA game they were dead. If they can continue to play the way that they played in that ACC tournament, they're going to be hard to beat. Now, if BC beats Providence, then they get the winner of UNLV in Princeton, I believe. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure with NIT, if there's like weird, like changing of the brackets or anything, I don't think there is, but they get the winner of that game. And then if they continue to go, they play two games, I believe in the Hinkle uh, field house, you, um, which is where Butler plays. And then it's on to the Madison square garden, how far Boston college can go. I'm not sure. There's some good teams in this, this tournament. Wake force is in there. They're obviously very good. Virginia Tech's in there. They they beat you pretty easily. So I'm not sure how far Boston College can go, but it doesn't honestly doesn't matter. Beat Providence and even beat UNLV in Princeton, and that's a success. You can consider that a success, and 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 whatever is after that is gravy. So that's where we're at. And I saw someone tweet today that. No one gives, I think it was the Indiana guy from 247 who I work with. So I should, I'm not going to trash him too bad, but he said, no one who's a power five program should give a crap about the NIT. Well, for Boston College, when you have had the struggles that you've had, you should give a crap about the NIT. That, that's the way it is. Like you, you can't just do the tournament or bust with this team right now. They're not that level. They, they got, they, they've got a long way to go before they can have that mind frame. So this is a big opportunity for BC. The games at seven will be live tomorrow after the game to talk about the NIT and everything else in between. Now in our final segment, I want to look at a question that I've seen popping up all over the internet, which is has BC's basketball season been a success? We'll look at the positives and negatives and give our analysis in just a moment. Now, say goodbye to your busted brackets. And if you're like me, I, I've already made my bracket and I know come tomorrow around five, I'm going to be tearing it up. Now, if you're like me and your bat bra- busted bat bracket is so busted that you're just like, what the heck do I do now? You got to go to FanDuel because they let you bet on every game of the tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. And I'm going to tell you guys, I have my underdog um, Cinderella team of the tournament. I'm going with the Drake Bulldogs. They've got that uh, DeVries, I think his name is. Love him. Their coach is awesome. And they got my favorite mascot, Griff the Bulldog. So I pick them based off of that. Yes, I'm like the, the secretary at your work. But right now, new customers get $200 to bonus bets if your first with your first winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks to be used on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. 
Just don't pick the UConn Huskies. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. This is Locked On Boston College. I'm your host, AJ Black. And let's talk a little basketball again because we just we just went over the NIT, which was, I think, for many folks, the goal of this season. You know, a lot of folks were hoping that you would get to the tournament, but, you know, right around when the ACC tournament, I mean, ACC play started, you started to realize, hey, this team's probably not going to get there. So that begs the question, should we be happy and satisfied with the progress of BC basketball? It's not an easy A or B answer. On one hand, yes, they made the NIT. That's the what, the goal of this year. You wanted to get some progress. You saw your win total go up for the third straight year. You're going from a team that had not been 500 to now a team that is 500. So in that sense, it's progress. You did not also lose to any garbage out of conference team. That's also progress. Loyola Chicago ended up being a not bad loss. They're in the NIT. So that I think is some things to hold your hat, you know, to hang your hat on. On the other hand, this is the most talented team that you've had in a long time. Not, not often do you get a big like Quinton Post that can do the things that he can do. You have some good guards with Jaden Zachary and Claudel Harris. You were expecting to, to see something out of that. And after starting off, what was it, 9-1 and one and out of conference play or 9-2? and two, To watch the ACC slip away like that and to lose games that you could have won, that was disappointing. And the fact that those losses, now now that you're, you're into that zone again where – Hey, if you win a few more games, you are a tournament team. Like BC was like right on the edge of like, you know, they were like on the bad edge of it, but they were close enough that they could have been on that bubble. But you lose games like you did against Loyola Chicago. We're going to bring that game up again because you blew like, what did they have? Like a 13-0 run at the end of that game. You lose to Florida State when you don't, you can't get a play together. You have other losses, and I'm not—I don't have them in front of me now. But there was at least two or three others that were just late collapses. That's frustrating because you saw in front of you the potential of what this team could be, and especially now that we saw how they—they they, they ended in the ACC tournament. If they played like they did in that ACC tournament, how far this team could have gone? That's something to think about. So, is it a—is it? Is this season a success, given what I just said? Short answer, yes. Long answer, no. I'm not going to be, I don't think I'm super excited about it. But I do think there's some pride to think that BC is starting to turn things around. Now, the other piece on whether this is a success is also this growing dread in the back of my mind about next year. Because you're losing post. You don't have anyone, at least in my brain, that's ready to play. I do not think our money mighty can play major minutes. He's a good backup center. I don't know what's going on with Jaden Hastings. What we've heard sounds like he's going to be a guy that could be ready to go. But also, there's the lo- looming transfer portal. You know, you're seeing all these cryptic messages, and it sounds like there could be a, a lot of players off of BC that are entering the portal. Every team's having it. Syracuse just got, you know, they just lost a ton of guys in the portal. And it seems like that's going to be the, the, the way things go in college basketball. So I, the part of me that says this is a success also has this dread that next year, that success is going to tail off, but maybe, maybe just maybe Earl Grant is growing something here in his system, his culture is going to be able to weather the storm of losing a Quentin Post and whoever else in the transfer portal and get this team back to where they were and maybe grow again. Who knows? we got to wait and see what this roster looks like. The way college basketball looks, you know, the change is much more drastic than it is in college football. So they could lose a bunch of guys, but they could also grab a bunch of guys. 
and we'll have to wait and see how it goes. But you're not going to hear all of that until BC's out of the NIT, and hopefully that won't be for a while. This is AJ Black. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button before you go and like me on Twitter. Five, like me. What am I saying? Follow me on Twitter at AJ Black247 or Locked On BC. Head over to Eagle Insider. That's where I am the editor. I've got a killer ri- group of writers. I hope you come over and check out their work. Lots of recruiting news, lots of basketball stuff. We've got everything. Hockey, baseball, you name it, we have it. And if you're if you're interested in writing about what women's lacrosse, I'm still looking for a women's lacrosse writer. Hit me up, DM me. I'm, I'm interested in finding someone to do that. Thank you all so much for following along. Hit that like button on the way out. And thank you for making Locked On Boston College your first listen every day because this is Locked On BC, your team every day.